Hey, Michael with X-Force PC. Uh, we're going to do a little video here in just a minute on the GNS 530 and 430 from Real Sim Gear, and ask Austin, the creator of X-Plane, to come over and give those a spin because he used to have those in, uh, units in his plane, and I thought he could do a pretty good job, which I think he did. And um, if you want just these devices, head over to realsimgear.com to pick those up, and if you want a complete package or system that incorporates these devices, we have that at xforcepc.com where we will support the computer and the 430 and or 530 along with the system and the monitor and the yoke and all that good stuff. So um, if you're not familiar or don't feel like you could set that stuff up, we provide a sort of turnkey solution uh, at xforcepc.com. Without further ado, here's Austin giving his overview of these devices. Hey, okay, Austin Meyer here again. Today, I guess we're gonna look at the real SIM gear uh, G430 and G530 for X-Plane. So we're sitting here at Owens Field, which is where I'm based, and this is the default Owens Field for X-Plane. Oh, I'm gonna Mike Brown's uh, at his office with his computer set up, which uh, has, I guess the latest X-Plane, this is what, 1130 or whatever the latest one is that, that Ben put up on the net. And uh, the accuracy of the airport is simply stunning. I mean, that's the maintenance hangar that I have my airplane maintained. I mean, the FBO, my hangar is like right here. I mean, I might as well be at Owens Field right now. But anyway, um, here we are uh, in today uh, King Air. Um, of course, I actually find evolution in reality, but we'll just do the King Air now so I don't have the, the left turning P factor thing to deal with because I don't have any rudder pedals handy right here at Mike's office anyway. But uh, okay, let's get off the brakes. And today we're going to look at the real Sim Gear uh, G430. So let's punch it. All right, as we get this thing rolling, Mike, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, where you get these things and how much they cost? Well, if you just want to buy the real Sim Gear uh, devices themselves, we're, you know, we'd have you go to realsimgear.com. We're going to sell a package that will include the real Sim Gear as well as, you know, the monitor and the computer and the controllers and all that. Mm. But again, if you just want the real Sim Gear devices themselves, just go to realsimgear.com, and, then, and they're, they're in the $300 to $400 range a piece okay. each. Okay. So, all right, so three fifty to 400 bucks a piece, that's fine. Um, so, first of all, just disclaimer for the, the viewers here, I have not flown a G430 or a G530 in about a decade. I used to have these in my old uh, Cirrus SR22 that I used to fly. So I got quite a few hundred hours behind these avionics, but it's been about 10 years. Uh, these days I fly uh, Garmin G900X and Xavion when I fly my Evolution. But um, let's see if we can let it come back to me and give it a try. So the first thing I'm gonna do is uh, blast them off out of Owens. I'm gonna go, let's say, direct and then uh, I'm going to try and move my cursor back and let's go to C uh, A E enter so one of the things that's tricky about the Garmin 430 is it's impossible for any human to ever know whether they, they, they push the little push button or hit the enter key uh, it makes no sense to me at all when you're supposed to do which but since this simulates that accurately you can learn in the sim so when you get in the real airplane you're not uh, behind the curve trying to figure out when you hit enter versus when you push the button. Um, okay, so we just entered direct to CAE, and this is, uh, shall we say, uh, not the most challenging use ever of a Garmin 430, because what did we do? We just decided to go somewhere direct, yay. All right, now let's see if we can ratchet up the challenge factor a bit here and go out a little to something a little bit trickier. Let's go to procedure, and now we're going to select the approach. And the same as always, you have to guess when to push the button and when to hit enter. Now we're going to go, let's say, take the uh, ILS. No, let's take the RNAV. Let's take the RNAV to 1-1, one, because one, that'll have me go up past the airport and come around and bring it in. And I'm going to hit enter. And now let's say we wanted to start from Letus, for example. Enter. Now here's the thing, you have to remember to activate it. You can't just load it, you have to activate it. So you rotate down. Then you see all the things that you're gonna do. Then you have to hit FPL to get out of the flight planning screen and boom, there you go. So, and then you can range out to see what you're actually gonna do, which is to go on down here, I guess, and turn around and come back. So, um, there's a lot of things I did with this Garmin 430 just now that are not that intuitive. When do you rotate it to go from load to activate? Because load selects the approach. 
Activate actually turns it into the little magenta line that you can follow, you see. So um, we had to remember to activate it, not just load it, when you push enter, when you push the button, and all the, the little moves that you go through to actually select and load the instrument approach. And now that we've done it, we're uh, flying on along. So let's check the look at our message. Okay, inside airspace, we are inside Columbia uh, Metro Class Charlie. Uh, and nav date out of date. I don't know how you fix the nav date out of date warning here. I think you use Navigraph for that. Right? Oh yeah, Philip did set up Navigraph to be used in X-Plane, yeah. Okay, so I guess, uh, oh that's right, because this error message is coming from X-Plane. It's not coming from real sim gear. Because remember, the avionics that you see here are X-Plane avionics that were just dragged down onto the little uh, real sim gear window. So yeah, this is actually X-Plane software that's running on real sim gear. So any alert about out of date nav data and stuff like that is controlled by X-Plane. The nav data portion was done by Philip Munzel, as my wife says, our resident German, uh, who does all our avionics. And uh, yeah, updating, updating with Navigraph should absolutely get rid of that error. Okay, so we're motoring on along here, and uh, I'm starting to get a little bit uh, bored. So let's see if we can go, what is it, control, eh, that's not enough. Alternate T? Yeah, okay, here we go. We're gonna go for 16X ground speed to uh, run on along outbound. And, uh, wow, it's way out there, isn't it? So we're headed over Lake Murray now. And, oh, cool, so we, Philip did his little uh, procedure turn there. All right, so we're running at 16x. All right, and there's Letus. All right, I'm going to bring us out of 16x. And uh, let's see if we can uh, hit Letus here. Now, if we're flying this approach in reality, you can bet I'm going to have an approach plate in my lap on Xavion, which is an, uh, an avionics app that I wrote that shows approach plates and a lot more. I should do an Xavion video here one of these days. But, um, oh, okay, there's Letus. I would have uh, the approach plate in my lap, see all the altitudes and everything, rather than just following the magenta line and you know crossing my fingers that the altitudes are okay. So we hit lead us, we're gonna bring it on around, and the magenta line is beckoning. Now the real Garmin would probably have the magenta line going all the way up to the airplane. Uh, Philip was saying that he couldn't get that coded quite yet, but we'll have it coded at some point in the future that it, it doesn't, it shouldn't delete that magenta line in such large chunks. You see, it should delete it in smaller chunks, but that's just a little thing Philip can work on. But uh, okay, now we're heading back in. All right, now while we're coming in, let's say that we have to like change the, uh, the frequency or something like that. Let's see if I can remember how to do that. Uh, we, nope, we're going to push this. No, let's see if I can figure it out. Com, there's our com and nav flip flop. Oh, there we go. Okay, so now it's coming back to me. Uh, first things first, don't crash the plane. So, uh, so we, we, we rotate the radio frequency here and then push that to flip-flop. And then if you want to get up to the comm radios, you push <laughs> the button here and then rotate and then that flip-flops. And so the trick was pushing this little button rotates between uh, comm and nav radios. And then once you push this button to go to the right comm or nav radio and change the frequency, you push the little flip-flop button right up by it to switch <laughs> the flip-flop between active and standby. So it's um, not intuitive at all to me <laughs> at all, but uh, it is faithfully representing what the real Garmin 430 and 530 do. And that's good. That's when you need the sim the most, right? It's when the, what the real airplane does is hard to understand, well, you so you've got to practice in the sim. In the air. Yeah, you don't want to figure it out in the air when, when air traffic control is asking you to switch frequency or you're trying to dial in a new nav aid. And at the same time, remember, airplanes don't pause for you to figure stuff out. That's the thing about airplanes. You're not, you're not doing less than 100 knots. So, um, yeah, you want to figure it out in the sim where you have a pause button and also a zero dollar an hour operating cost. So why do we have the 430 simply as a backup? Uh, so in my Cirrus SR22 where I used to have, oh, let's look back at the history of the 430 in aviation. It used to be that airplanes had these pathetic, ridiculous old steam gauges, which are like literally, I'm not kidding, like just right out of steam engines from the old steam engine locomotives with these little needles that were indicating like speed and navigation deflection, just like they would indicate uh, steam pressure in an old steam locomotive. I'm literally not even exaggerating. It was ridiculous. And that 19... 50s or really 1940s or earlier technology persisted in aviation, I'm not kidding, through the 80s, seriously through the 80s. And then Garmin came along and said, why don't we take 
this new GPS thingy that we're just starting to get a hang of and put on a computer display so we can see where we're going. And when they did this, people bought Garmin 430s like crazy because it's like 10 times better than anything anyone had ever seen. And, and so tons of airplanes have these ancient old obsolete steam gauges to get across the sky, but they have this so they can actually navigate and see where the hell they're going. And nowadays, uh, we've leapfrogged past that to the Garmin 1000 and G G900X, which supersede this. And then uh, in my airplane, I have Xavion, which for me in many ways has superseded my Garmin 900. But um, so there's a whole lot of leapfrogs, but this is the first big one that aviation had in the kind of renaissance we're having now of avionics. Well, what's the purpose of having the 430? Is it just left over? Like they have, it was already there and they just left it when they put the 530 in? Uh, well, the 530 is just bigger. So first they got the 430 and they said, how about we get something that's like that but bigger? And so then they released the 530. It was nothing but a, a chance to make a product 5% better. In the plane, why do you have both of them? Oh, in okay, case so one breaks. Okay. That's Everything that's in awesome. aviation. Well, that's to say, every time you ever ask the question, why do you have two of something in aviation? The answer is always the same. It's in case one breaks. So you better so. practice though with the 530, I mean, excuse me, the 430. So oh, it's the same UI. It's exactly the same. It's just on a smaller screen is all. So you yeah, they're the same. Everything's the same. You Everything is the same. Okay. Yeah, they're all the same. This is just a bigger screen, slightly bigger screen. And so we have them both in case one breaks. The 530 just has a little bigger screen and costs a few dollars more. And there's a lot of them in air airplanes right now because people pay their 10,000 bucks or whatever to get them installed in the real airplanes. They can navigate with their stupid old steam gauges to, to choose their airspeed and heading and altitude while navigating with an actual computer display in their old 1950s uh, tin can beaters. And now that these are in all these airplanes, heck, that's that's... $20,000 for two of them or $10,000 for one of them well spent. No one's going to take them out and replace them with anything else unless they want to go to the next Garmin product, the Garmin G900 or something like that. But then they're down for $60,000. And so nobody wants that. So they stay with these old 430s and 530s. And that's why these things are all over the sky. So that's the history of this little piece of avionics. And uh, the simulation of these avionics, and specifically this is the real sim gear, they call it the real sim gear G430 and real sim gear G530? G GNS 430 and GNS 530. Okay, great. So the real sim gear GNS 430 and 530 uh, simulate that little uh, point in aviation where things first started to change. And I flew them for about 500 hours in my old Cirrus SR-22. And sure enough, this very, very, very faithfully recreates it. The feel of the buttons is a little different. It's like the buttons are a little easier to push. And I can kind of feel them shake or rattle just a little bit after I push them. It's not quite as damped a button feel. So you can tell it's a little, you know, less expensive, uh, you know, button feel and stuff like that. But, uh, I mean, they're the right size, the right shape, the right place. So it's basically just about, for all intents and purposes, uh, like operating the real one. And we've been following the Magenta line while I talk. And of course, now we are arriving at Columbia Metro, where I used to be based, although I'm based at Owens now. So why don't we do a landing at my good old fashioned uh, home airport, Columbia Metro, and we'll call, call it a day. Mm -hmm. Yep, so we got our nav radios, our comm radios, our instrument approaches, our direct, and uh, the 430 and 530, uh, the nav database updates. Uh, you can do VNAV. Oh, yeah, target altitude, zero miles before. So, you know, you can say, all right, I want to be at, you know, 100 feet, you know, MSL at a certain distance before I get to a point. That's the thing air traffic control likes to ask a lot. Do you remember if I lowered the landing gear? No. Looks like I did. Okay. You never, put, you never put them up, I don't think. No, I did. I did. I just oh, lowered okay. it by instinct. Okay. So, uh, so there you go. The real sim gear G430 and G530, quite nicely executed, and at like 350 or 400 bucks for a very, very nice price too.